Welcome Main Street Stock Investors to Market Talk Monday here on the Paul Mampilla YouTube channel, the home of the Bold Profit Strong Hands Nation. I'm Amber Lancaster, thanks for tuning in. And today, as you can see, Paul himself, in Living Color is joining us to answer questions regarding recent uh, breakout short squeezes and small cap mean stocks that have really been pushed higher in recent weeks by retail and Main Street investors in a phenomenon that is known as a crowdsourcing of a short squeeze. And also, I'd like you to stay tuned to see the results of a research project I recently conducted via Bloomberg that actually shows the most uh, shorted US stocks with market caps greater than $1 billion. Quite interesting to take a look at. So hello, Paul, great to see you. <laughs> Thanks, Amber. Thanks for having me on again. Market Talk has completely blossomed. Incredible, awesome job. People love you. I look at the comments. You're so popular. So thanks for having me on. On, I believe it's a historic time, Amber. Oh, beyond a historic, historic. It's a historic time. I mean, really, like what you're talking about, like, you know, it's like really like in the, in the 1990s, Amber, you remember like really when people really started to regular people, people like you and me started to have access to the stock market. Yes. Before that, it was so crazy expensive. Trades used to cost, if I remember, mm -hmm. I think each trade used to be like 25 or $50 in commissions. It's the truth, yeah. Yeah, that was great. Now, who could afford that? No one could no afford one. that. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was a very exclusive club. And really in the 1990s, and you had a series of things like like the, the broker, just like E-Trade coming on mm -hmm. that allowed you know anyone to get online, just open an account before it was very complicated. And this I believe is the next step in this. In other words, social media has now essentially really made it all equal. It used to be, and I said this on the Ian Caswell, used to be that if you, if you were a company that had a stock that was trading public, you kind of had to go bow down before the powers that be. Yes. To bow down in front of the investment banks, bow down in front of these analysts, bow down in front of people that are analysts and portfolio managers at hedge funds and at these mutual funds or at these big family offices. Mm -hmm. Well, GameStop, Wall Street bats, all of this, this people calling the meme trading, whatever you want to call it, what it really is, is giving equal access to all the smart people in the world mm -hmm. that can do the same kind of analysis that all these folks used to claim that only they could do. But this capability was always out there. There were mm -hmm. always a ton of smart people who were able to go and work things out. However, they were given no access. No. to people and they were denied access to capital and they to start a hedge fund is very expensive mm -hmm. to get a job as a portfolio manager as a credit analyst you have to go to harvard or yale or something to be selected however just about anybody can get on reddit mm -hmm. just about anybody can get on twitter anybody can get on snapchat or youtube or TikTok. so it is a two democratization really of ideas of information of, the, of really, of it's really essentially free speech. Uh, if you believe that that a stock can go up and you lay out your analysis, people can read it. If they agree with you, they can choose to invest alongside with you. So I took some notes on some of the things that I really think that this really means, which is that you mentioned this, which is that there's this buying that is now going on that has always happened, Amber. I can tell you from working on Wall Street, um, the, what happens at these Wall Street conferences? Well, everybody talks to each other yeah. and they ask you, each, everyone asks each other, so what are you buying? Well, this is what I'm buying. And of course it ends up influencing and they're always what are called key opinion leaders. Mm. And those people, they're not appointed officially. It's just that people think that, oh, these people are really smart. Their analysis is really right. And people end up copying each other. So much of this in a, in a kind of way already is sort of replicating behavior that existed, except in very exclusive circles. And so really Reddit or any of these social media platforms are simply doing what hedge funds have done. Mm -hmm. Mutual fund managers and analysts have done for ages. And there's a second element 
to this, which is really interesting, which has to do with what I believe is a takeover of the economy, the markets, really the way things are going to keep happening by the millennial generation and Gen Z, yeah. which is if you look at the stocks that they targeted, Amber, mm -hmm. you really see a sort of like a nostalgia effect, mm -hmm. like a hearkening back to their teenager times, their childhood. I mean, of course, they picked GameStop. They all went and bought games at GameStop. They went and got went and traded games at GameStop. So there is a huge nostalgia factor. And then you look at the second stock that's part of this meme trade that's most powerful, AMC. It's theaters, it's movies, mm -hmm. uh, it's the coming of the megaplexes, which came out around that time when the millennial generation were kids um, and where they probably spent a lot of time probably going from one theater to another, probably without paying for multiple tickets. <laughs> uh, Blackberry, you know, those Blackberry devices, Nokia, the old Nokia phones, in other words, the first phones. So there is a huge element to this, which is kind of reminiscent of other Wall Street activity where activist hedge funds can help old companies survive by injecting them, injecting capital into them which is kind of what these social media platforms are doing. If you go and look uh, on, on Reddit and other places, there is a lot of talk about saving AMC. Mm -hmm. In other words, where Wall Street and the so-called sophisticated investors have targeted this company really for demise and ultimate termination. And you have a group of people saying, hey, that's part of our childhood. That's part of who we are and we want this company to survive. Mm -hmm. So you can see that there a lot of what is going on is actually reminiscent of things that are already being done except by big money players and it's simply the same effect same things activity now simply really being translated to regular folks mm -hmm. to regular people through a platform uh, social media platforms that everyone can access and um a lot of people think that this is going to be a one-time thing. I disagree. I believe that this is going to continue and we are going to actually see more of it. And the biggest thing is that that I think that why we've seen these restrictions on trading, mm -hmm. et cetera, are the calls for it. And by the media, the regular media calling for these restrictions to continue is that it really shifts power from where it used to be with, again, the Wall Street elites, investment banks, hedge funds, mutual funds, portfolio managers, analysts, really to regular people that can affect stock prices, can affect where money flows into. And that is a significant power. It, it means that you can affect what companies survive. You can support certain technologies, certain products, certain services. Um, and um, for us, it's a great sign because what it means is that so much power and money right now, Amber, is concentrated in Apple, Microsoft, Google, Facebook, yeah. and companies like that. Mm -hmm. And what it's doing is moving money from that top layer where we, these companies are worth trillions of dollars. Mm -hmm. And then you've got all these tiny companies that have been effectively starved of capital for 15, 20 years. And this is part of money moving to effectively America 2.0 companies, right. fourth industrial revolution companies, innovation companies. These are the companies that we focus on at in Profits Unlimited and across all of our services at our publisher, Bold Profits. So if you're interested in these kinds of companies, uh, you should check into our services. Profits Unlimited is our flagship service. There'll be a link below for profitsunlimited.com. Check into that and you can see we have been focused on this opportunity in a very similar way for a long period of time for us. So for us, there is no disruption. We are actually something that we anticipated a lot of this that would happen. Um, and we're in the companies that are going to benefit from really this democratization of information, of ideas. They're gonna flow into our companies. Mm -hmm. So our readers um, are, are really already positioned to benefit in a big way. And the last place which we focused on, on the Incast, and I really recommend everyone go watch that, is also going to benefit a lot of these crypto platforms that have already begun to list 
uh, offshore, away from U.S. regulation, away from U.S. restrictions, uh, access through tokens for, for, for GameStop and for AMC and for Nokia and BlackBerry and also any of the other trades that are essentially being restricted on some level here, more democratization in terms of where you can access trading. So for us, we see no great systemic threat. I have seen an article where some folks from Goldman Sachs and interactive brokers are claiming that it would lead to this, this snowball effect. Mm -hmm. However, there's no sign of it yet. And also when I look at it, Amber, there's plenty of capital that's out there. You've reported on Market Talk there's trillions of dollars, trillions of dollars that is sitting on there. And so people have access to capital. I believe that anyone that wants it today can get it. Uh, Robinhood recently raised $1 billion in a day. Yes. <laughs> it didn't even take one, one day they raised a billion. And I'm pretty sure that if they want another billion that is available to them, because most people know that in the long term, Platforms like Robinhood, they know the brokerage firm model is very sticky. Mm -hmm. Once you're with a brokerage firm, in all likelihood, it's very hard to move. Yeah. Robinhood's user interface is way better, way easier, gamified like nobody else is. And while people may want to move, my guess is that there's a lot of protests right now. However, the truth is, is that there's very few alternatives. And, uh, and everyone's restricting trading in all of these things. So the money that's going to move is actually going to move to the crypto market. Mm -hmm. And Ian, our incredible colleague, Ian Dyer, has been on top of this. And we're looking to start a crypto service pretty soon. So subscribe to Bold Profits Daily, which is our free e-letter. E Check to ProfitsUnlimited.com, which is our flagship newsletter to keep track of all of this incredible news. And of course, follow my amazing, incredible colleague, Amber Lancaster, who does do a phenomenal job of keeping Main Street informed of what matters. Mm -hmm. So thank you for doing an incredible job, Amber, and I am done. <laughs> oh, you're welcome, Paul. Well, I'm so glad that you're with us today because we reached out to Twitter subscribers or Twitter followers uh, late last week, and they actually came in with quite a few questions for you, Paul. So okay. I have I have a few that I like you to chime in on. So okay. the first question that we have, I'm going to put it up on the screen for everyone to read along. It's from Judy. Uh, Judy says that eight different stocks on Robinhood, not a lot, um, but it's for her. Uh, should she wants to know should I sell it all and get out of Robinhood? Robinhood. I am very upset over all this GameStop and Robinhood actions. Please help me. <laughs> right. I mean, we are we 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 are the wrong authority to tell you all of this. Uh, in the end, there is risk in every single brokerage company. Uh, they are subject to capital requirements of various kinds. Anything I said about Robinhood is no sponsor, no uh, endorsement of them. Mm -hmm. That's just based on my history of having seen. Uh, a lot of these companies being able, and Robinhood being able to raise money, it's possible for Robinhood to be uh, someone that you know people flee and mass. However, when I look at what everyone else is doing, they're all doing some variation of what Robinhood is doing. In other words, restricting trading to some extent because their business model no longer can really allow them to continue to allow these take these take in these kinds of trades because they themselves have to find somebody to take the opposite side of the trade. So is Robin Hood going to survive? I want to say nothing about this because I do not want to be blamed if something were to occur. Robin Hood is still a private company. They have access to their venture capital investors that have billions and billions of dollars. Uh, so uh, it is a judgment ultimately that people are going to have to make on their own. There are people on social media that are fear mongering on this. And so uh, you have to definitely take what they say with a grain of salt, given that they often have their own vested interest that they are trying to push. Right. I love that. Uh, so Juliana writes, Paul, uh, Robinhood and other brokers blocking the buying of GameStop, Nokia, AMC, and many other stocks. Is that legal? Can that be seen as market manipulation? Um, yes, it is legal. When you go read your brokerage agreement, it does include a number of clauses that can allow them to stop you trading in certain securities, uh, stop you from trading in certain quantities, or simply restrict trading in full. 
Uh, the brokerage business model, everyone needs to understand where is that they are not the ones that are filling your order. They give your order to somebody else to fill. And if that other party is unable to fill it, they are unable to actually give you that stock. They themselves uh, put themselves at risk if they are to go and buy into something that is unavailable in the market. There is a limited amount of GameStop stock or Nokia stock or BlackBerry stock that is out there. Mm -hmm. And so the only way to deliver stock at a certain price for some might be to take the other side and that is not part of their business model. They depend on somebody else to do that. And if somebody else is unwilling to do that, then they are forced necessarily to restrict trading is something that they have no choice to do to some extent. Mm, good answer there, Paul. Uh, Stack to the 2-2, also known as Thackeray asks via Twitter, I've been using Robinhood and having great gains. What are some respectable exchanges to use now? Well, there's exchanges uh, and then there are brokerages. Mm -hmm. Exchanges, we have two dominant exchanges in the United States, the New York Stock Exchange and the NASDAQ Exchange. So those are places where companies are listed, meaning that's the official place they're supposed to trade. Mm -hmm. And then you can see there are also a number of digital exchanges like BATS and others where stocks on any exchange trade on. So there's exchanges and there's brokerages. Brokerages are the ones where you open an account, you put your money in there, and then they facilitate the trading into the stocks that you want to buy and sell. They themselves usually are different than the people that are actually getting you the stocks. Those folks are called market makers and they represent a completely different group. In some cases, they are investment banks, hedge funds, or just official market making. And what their job to do is to keep the flow of money going in the stock market. If you want to buy, they will either sell you their shares from their inventory or else they have to take the other side naked. In other words, they sell you something that they do not have. And now they're depending on the price going down in the future to be able to make their money back or at least getting back to whatever it is. So if they sell you something and the price keeps going up, now obviously they are in huge liability and that's a problem for them. So they can choose to stop transacting in this because they see it as a risk to their business model. So uh, the brokerage firms that are out there, this is a very uh, uh, small group now there's Fidelity, there's Schwab, there's TD Ameritrade, there's obviously Robinhood, there's Interactive Brokers. We get no money from any of them. We are completely neutral. We do not recommend any of them. Ultimately, you have to decide who you want to stay with uh, ultimately, and based on obviously a judgment as to their safety. It is possible for brokerage firms to go bankrupt, obviously. Um, and people are, uh, are, are wondering uh, about that with respect to Robinhood. However, the fact that they were able to raise a billion dollars would tell you that their investors are willing to put capital up. It's a private company, so no one can actually know what the state of their finances are. None, uh, however, Schwab and TD Ameritrade and others are publicly traded companies. And so you can see what their financial position is. Mm -hmm. And they too, to the extent uh, if they feel that they are taking on too much risk, they are also going to restrict trading in these stocks for this reason. We are not in a position to recommend any brokers. Our, our lawyers and our legal department would, would have a complete fit if we did that. So ultimately, this is a judgment call that you are going to have to make. There are a lot of resources on the internet that you can simple Google, simply Google for, and they will give you various ratings of various kinds that can help you in your decision. Very good answer there, Paul. Uh, RJ has a question for you. If a grown-up adult wants to go to a casino with his her hard-earned money, understanding the risk of losing it all, can someone stop them to go there or lock the casino for them? I hope you understand my question. <laughs> right, I, and I have seen this, and I, I believe that the, the there's two things here. The casinos periodically, if you've ever have gone to a casino, will sometimes simply shut down a table. Mm. If they're losing too much money, they will say close the bets out and they will shut it down. Uh, it's never done easily because they never want to anger a client that they want to come back. Um, and the truth is, is that the markets are, are, are have a certain organization and there is only 
a certain amount of capacity to take on bets of if everyone decides they want to own one stock, well, someone has to take the other side. Mm -hmm. There's no magical other side that's created because everyone decides they want to buy one stock today. Someone has to take the other side. And the only way that that can then be facilitated is then for the price perhaps to be set at such a high price that it reduces the demand for that stock. So this is the, the demand and supply balance that's usually played by various market participants. It might be hedge funds, maybe investment banks, proprietary trading, uh, retail traders. And so this is how markets are managed. And if there is a lot of short-term demand, the markets are used to having enough time to balance that out where they can lift prices up. So if everyone wants to buy XYZ stock, now, right now, if there's a market interruption, maybe the price opens back up at 1,000. Mm -hmm. At 1,000, the number of people who are willing to buy is a lot less. And so the market then sorts itself out and people say, well, I wanted my bet in at 100. The thing is, there was no one willing to take the other side of it. Mm -hmm. And just because you want to buy it does not necessarily create the other side at that price. Mm -hmm. There may be someone that wants to buy it. However, it may be at a, may, may be someone that wants to fulfill that trade on the other side, but it might be at a much higher price where their risk, their downside is also accounted for. Mm -hmm. So that's an in-between answer uh, to, to that question. Good answer. Uh, Ray from Twitter asks, uh, well, when a stock is shorted beyond the available float and a hedge fund has the entire audience of the financial media to post their short report and manipulate, they have no right to cry out about retail investors pushing back. Does the SEC have any rules against uh, Wall Street bets uh, Red is Wall Street bets, in your opinion? Uh, the, the SEC uh, uh, is regulates all of the stock markets and uh, has a series of requirements. There is a list of, uh, of stocks where um, they're called hard to locate stocks because when you go to short a stock, what you are doing is you are selling something you do not actually own. Mm -hmm. And the way that is facilitated, Amber, in the markets is that it is lent to you um, within the market structure and their lending rates for that. So the idea with shorting is that you sell something with the idea you're going to buy it back cheaper. And uh, various people engage in it either on the basis that the company is overvalued or on a short-term basis, it can be that there's too much short-term demand right now. And people can see based on historical patterns, uh, artificial intelligence, algorithms that this demand is likely to fall off. So if you sell people today something for 100 because there's a lot of excitement, there's a lot of enthusiasm, that enthusiasm may fade and then the price will fall back down. Somebody is willing to take the outside. However, if there is a relentless amount of pressure put on it, then um, there's no one willing to take the other side. Now, with respect to short interest, I personally believe that stocks should never be shorted beyond the 100% mark. Um, and I have no idea how this has continued to happen for really years and years and years. Uh, I believe the SEC has tried to stamp it out in various ways. Nonetheless, for any number of stocks, this has continued to happen. Um, uh, shorting in of itself uh, has a market function, as we mentioned, to balance out demand and supply. However, a stock being short beyond 100% yeah, it definitely defies a little bit of logic. Nonetheless, there are real world uh, sort of uh, things that you can think about. For example, airlines oversell planes mm -hmm. because many people never show up. So it's hard to know necessarily what the exact function is. I believe that perhaps in some stocks that perhaps it is something that can happen where the balance sifts out pretty quickly. However, for something to be 140% shorted for multiple years or for five years, that's a little bit difficult. And I believe that if a hedge fund has taken that bet, then it's, you know, they should pay the price for it. I mean, they've made a bet and uh, the, the outcome is not what they want. I believe that they should pay the price for it. Very good, Paul. And so we have one from S. Bycraft. Uh, 
S uh, Bycraft writes, uh, we'd love to hear from you and Paul on GameStop. We held it in one of Paul's portfolios, but sold uh, before, be unfortunately, before the huge run up. Would love to know your Paul's thoughts on this. And for this uh, webcast, I did uh, have, I'm posting just to show what people get, did gain in GameStop in your Extreme Fortune service, which is well over 200%, Paul. So any thoughts? Right. Mm -hmm. right, so I have to put my hands up and say guilty as charged. Uh, we owned GameStop at a very cheap price. Mm -hmm. um, and the truth is, is that sometimes uh, the negativity and the news that is put out by regular media, sometimes the pressure that comes from readers when a position goes down, uh, you know, affects me and I, I, I fully admit to being human, uh, which is that we were, were made something like, was it about 200% that we made on, on, on yeah. GameStop, yes. right? Yes. Yes. right? And uh, I obviously had no idea at that moment in time that there was this, this, uh, this meme um, trade that was developing because truthfully, I have never really uh, followed Reddit. I do follow some amount of stocks on, on, on Twitter and, and YouTube, and those are the social media pl platforms that I tend to look on, look on to see uh, and test what people are thinking. So I had no idea that this was unfolding. And in truth, uh, GameStop is part of a declining industry. The brick and mortar retail industry is in deep decline. We have seen multiple bankruptcies, whether it be JCPenney, Sears. And so it seemed reasonable at that point in time that uh, even though GameStop at that moment in time had a lot of cash um, and was actually buying back stock. And then what happened is that after we sold, a number of events happened to actually lift the stock up. The billionaire that actually founded Chewy put hundreds of millions, I believe, I forget the number, into GameStop and went on their board. Um, there were other events that occurred really as to support the stock to take in the shares. So we missed out. And you know what it does for me is now uh, really make sure to think that there is now a new powerful player in the market, which is regular people putting out analysis and also where they can support the company's technologies and products that they believe in, the companies that they want to survive no different than before, where sometimes the US government, they wanted General Motors to survive, so they pump money into it. Um, there have been times when private equity have come in and they've put money into a company because they, they felt that it had a good shot to survive. Well, the people have that right too. They want GameStop to survive. They want AMC to survive. And I guess people want Nokia and BlackBerry to survive. Those I'm a little bit more, more questioning of because there's so much more competition in, in those markets. Nonetheless, I see the nostalgia value certainly in the first two. So uh, yep, I, I, I got the sell off that wrong. That's going to happen. I tell our folks all the time, I can't get things wrong. I can make mistakes. And that I will put as something as a learning experience, take it into account and, in, and use it in the future. Wonderful, Paul. And our last couple of questions are actually outside of what we've been discussing so far today. And one is from Denise. Um, she would like to know, should Intel, an old world 1.0 company, be dumped for an America 2.0 company? Well, um, I believe that uh, if you subscribe to Profits Unlimited, and yes, I'm shamelessly shilling Profits Unlimited, uh, ProfitsUnlimited.com. Uh, mm -hmm. Since we do give away a lot for free on this channel, uh, we do have what we call an America 1.0 list, the blacklist. Mm -hmm. And if you go in there, it actually has a list of companies that we believe are on the outs. In other words, they represent really the targets of disruptification where their business models, their companies, their products and services are in declining demand. And that is going to lead to a decline uh, in the demand for their stock. And obviously uh, over time, if you have a decline in demand for your products and services, it's gonna lead ultimately to the demise of your company, no different than Sears or, or any of these other companies. So um, we generally do not comment on single stocks here and I'm gonna kind of stick to that policy. Mm -hmm. And uh, yes, shamelessly shill uh, profitsunlimited.com um, and say that the answer is actually there. Um, and um, please, uh, you know, you can look at it uh, in, in there. Perfect. And our last uh, question is a two-parter from Asif. So Asif writes, he would be interested to hear some war stories from you, Paul, about your time working at Wall Street, on Wall Street. 
I'll tell you what, Amber, next time I come on, save, uh, save this question for next time. And we'll set a little segment on for war stories from Wall Street. I definitely have them. But I know perhaps know. today we have gone long enough and we should save that for another time. I think that's a good idea, Paul. And we'll save his second part question was actually about buy, buying a home versus renting a home, which is quite an interesting topic in itself. Right. And we'll, we'll, we can do that uh, another time. And perhaps we can have our terrific colleague Tamara on that covers the millennial ho housing market on. And she can also chime in with what she thinks about the housing market because we have a phenomenal, incredible, astonishing team. Uh, and I believe that you, if you subscribe to our channel, you can have access to all of them. All right, Amber, oh. I'm done talking. Oh, brilliant job, Paul. We want to thank you so much for coming in to Market Talk today. I'm sure everyone's most uh, helped by all of your astounding uh, knowledge. So thank you for sharing it with us. Thanks, Amber, for having me on. Thank you so much. Oh, you're most welcome. Take care. See you soon. I want to again thank Paul for joining us today on Market Talk Monday. And please remember to click the subscribe button to get instant video alerts uh, for this channel, the Paul Mint Pilly YouTube channel. And also you can visit us at bullprofitsdaily.com to sign up to receive our free investment e-letter delivered right to your email inbox. And to wrap up, uh, just like as seen in this chart, this performance chart for GameStop, which is up over 1600% year to date, a meteoric rise. Uh, my Bloomberg news wires this morning were red hot with reporting how silver is now breaking out as retail investors push the metal to its highest level since 2013, which for me is just another example of how the massive momentum individual stock investors, how much they're bringing to this market. And one last note uh, before I leave for today, uh, Robinhood has reduced the number of companies with trading restrictions to eight uh, from 50. So eight stocks um, that are listed on your screen now shows you that, uh, well, per Bloomberg News, open new positions in these eight securities is limited. Uh, investors can only hold a maximum number of shares and option contracts as seen in this image. And know uh, that you do not have to navigate these markets alone. Trading Guru Paul is here to help with a proven uh, stock trading track record as seen in his Extreme Fortune Stock Trading Service. Uh, members of this service have open gains of 716%, 798%, and as much as 810% when I checked on the track this morning and closed a realized gains of 1,142% in plug power, 601% in sun run, and 524% in foundation medicine. So it's the real deal stock trading service. Uh, to learn more, click the link in the description section of this video. And as promised earlier, check out this recent list I researched uh, today of the most shorted U.S. stocks with market caps greater than $1 billion. And as you can see, GameStop uh, still tops the list with short interest as a percentage of equity float of 122.97%, followed by Dillard's, uh, Big Commerce Holdings, and Fubo TV. And as Paul mentioned today and last week's Ian Cass, as he mentioned, uh, going forward, he doesn't foresee hedge funds having uh, short positions exceeding 100% after recent events. So keep that in mind. And finally, turning toward the U.S. economic calendar week ahead, there will be five major economic releases. On Wednesday, January's ADP employment change will post at 8.15 a.m. On Thursday, December's factory and durable goods orders will post at 10 a.m. And on Friday, a January's jobs report and December's trade balance will post at 8 a.m. 30 a.m. And remember that you can follow Paul and me on Twitter at Mampilly Guru and at a Lancaster Guru. And of course, throughout the trading week, I aim to tweet out a reply or a response to any of these economic releases, taking our hashtag BOP bullish optimistic positive take for most of these releases. So that concludes this week's Market Talk, everyone. Thank you for hanging in there. I know it's a bit longer than normal, but we do appreciate you uh, stopping by. We hope that you did. Um, maybe learn some nuggets of information on helping with your trading endeavors. So until next time, have a great week, a healthy week ahead. Uh, take care.